Uh, next up is Jesse Gillis. And for those of you who were waiting with bated breath for the armadillos promised this morning by uh, Dr. Gold, they are coming shortly. Uh, Jesse is also the first of the really computational folks that's, uh, that are going to dominate tomorrow, but we only got a, a, a wink and a nod today. Uh, Jesse is a professor of computational genetics at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Uh, he's got a wide variety of work that he is known for, from computation to neuroscience to the stuff he's going to talk to us about next. So thanks very much to Larry for the uh, kind invitation to speak, and thanks very much to the organizers for all the help uh, in making this challenging year happen. So my topic is the transcriptional legacy of developmental stochasticity. And there are probably three uh, key words there. One is uh, development. So there's gonna be a story about early development, moving on and having an impact later in development. Uh, stochasticity, by which I just mean early randomness. And transcriptional. So there's gonna be a story about gene expression. And probably the um, main figure that people have seen when they think of this topic is a Waddington landscape. So Waddington landscapes are shown in a lot of different contexts, but um, typically they're thought of as cell lineage histories. So you start out with a single cell and it divides and divides and divides, and it moves down and you move down these paths and eventually you end up with the different cell phenotypes. And that's how an organism's development proceeds from single cell to ultimately a fully realized biology. And what we're interested in particularly is how this can happen at the organismal level as well. So if rather than thinking of the, the shared um, genotype of the cell, we think of organisms having a shared genotype potentially as an identical twins, then there can be some variability that proceeds epigenetically or through different mechanisms, could be environmental, and yields um, completely different phenotypes to some degree. So again, typically thought of as a cell lineage progression, but we're interested in applying it to the organismal level. And this obviously happens in real biology because uh, identical genomes yield different phenotypes. And the clearest example of that in humans, at least, is that twins have different fingerprints. Um, but certainly another example that people are familiar with is calico cats, where it's absolutely known that the pattern of exon activation generates the code pattern, which is different um, even for identical uh, cats. So it, it can have identical uh, genotypes and they'll have quite different coat phenotypes because the coloration pattern depends on which X chromosome is expressed, which varies in a lineage dependent manner. And there's been a lot of interest in analyzing this in model systems, uh, which is challenging because what you simultaneously need is, is control of genotypes. You need to be able to generate identical genotypes, but also different genotypes. So not just inbred mouse, but many, many um, inbred lines, let's say. And so one example of this is Drosophila, where people have generated many in red lines, since you can look at variability even within a fixed genotype. Another is an example of a clonal fish that arose naturally and exhibits different swimming patterns, um, which are epigenetically presumably regulated because they're not genetically regulated. So this is um, the topic that interests us, but th these are clearly challenging systems. So in, in humans and cats, we have this sort of random variability that we know influences phenotype, but we don't know whether is it just fingerprints, is it just coat color? Um, whereas in systems where we have a lot of control, they're quite distant evolutionarily from humans. So they're not mammals, they're quite far from us. And so it's hard to say whether the things we find there will generalize to humans. And um, in general, this is probably important because if you think about it, something which is absolutely fixed in, in uh, development. So if there's a program that just proceeds, which is the way development is sometimes thought of for very simple organisms, that can lend, uh, render you rather inflexible to environmental changes. So there's, there's all these ideas floating around that you may have heard of. Um, fetal programming was a popular idea. Certainly, um, it's timely to think about in the, in the wake of COVID that you know, in the flu epidemic, the height of um, men born after the flu epidemic is standard deviations shorter than expected. So the, the fact that the mothers were exposed to influenza affected for the, the lifespan of their offspring, their entire lives affected their heights. And you can see this lovely trend where the, the, um, the, the height uh, pattern falls. So males have steadily been rising in height and then they've fallen. That may, that may very well happen in, with COVID as well, with these sort of weak exposures which don't kill people do affect offspring. So you can have this, um, the impact of the maternal environment can have a, a long-term impact on the offspring. And often that's advantageous. So often um, you want to be able to tune your offspring to the environment. And that was um, the idea of the fetal programming. 
So on the one hand, developmental specification um, allows for genetic buffering, meaning if there's variability that might be damaging, if, if it's really specified, then it won't, it won't cause damage. On the other hand, you do want some variability because you want to have adaptability and uh, volvability um, in, the, in the organism. And so the, the uh, um, trade-off between these two factors creates individuality. And that's what makes individuals quite different from one another. We don't have all identical twins acting or even looking alike. You can look at them and they look subtly different because they aren't entirely specified from um, embryonic stages onward. So um, one of the ways one can investigate this is exactly the same thing I described for, for the calico cat of cats. Now the calico cat of cats, the reason it occurs as this output where you see very different patterns in coloration is because it's linked uh, to chromosomal differences. So it's linked to which of the two X chromosomes is expressed in the cat in each cell. And we know that that's inherited down the cell lineage, but it's random initially. And so that lets us have a sort of general model of how to understand intrinsic, by which I mean variability within cells versus extrinsic noise, which is variability outside cells. So if I have some signal coming from outside the cells and it hits the cells, and then um, internally, they're gonna respond identically. I'm calling that extrinsic. And that variability could, could, lots of different things could happen. One cell could be exposed to one stimulus, another cell could be exposed to another, but all of that will be extrinsic variability. On the other hand, if I have a stimulus hit the cell and there's still noise from variability within the cell, I'm calling that intrinsic variability. And fortunately, we can measure that within uh, mammals uh, and most organisms because we have two copies of most genes. And so we can see whether there are different responses um, from this external stimulus, which both of those copies share, but one responds a lot and one responds a little. Well, that has to be due to variability within the cells, right? Because they have the same, those chromosomes saw the exact same thing outside the cells. And so that's intrinsic variability versus extrinsic variability. And intrinsic variability can have a long-term impact because it can be fixed. So you have one chromosome gets highly expressed. This is what happens in X inactivation. One chromosome gets expressed, not the other one. And then every single cell that follows that cell will have the exact same feature, even though it was random originally. So we're gonna be interested in measuring intrinsic and extrinsic noise in mammals particularly. And um, we think that these things can matter because we know that there is a, a really large number of factors that can affect gene expression and development. And we think that we need to control a lot of them to measure these subtle influences of things like noise, even though they matter. And so a good example of this is mouse strains, where everyone understands in biology that mouse strains are useful because they, they really reduce noise. But what I'm showing here is that on different um, strains, if you have different genetic uh, perturbations, you can still have really, really different responses. You can have responses that are at the top here conditioned on the genetic background. So they're very consistent given the genetic background, but vary from one genetic background to the other. Or you can have, and this looks a lot more like the sort of intrinsic maybe noise, but it also could be extrinsic, but intrinsic noise where um, you, know, you move from one copy to the next, one identical genetic copy to the next, and there's a lot of variability in the output of the gene. And it's not just about the genetic background. And then in other cases, of course, every single mouse is a good, a good model. But what this demonstrates is that it's not enough to have a single genetically replicable organism that one wants to have many, many such um, strains in theory to generate robust results. And this is an idea that is, is uh, discussed a lot these days, which is the idea that trans genetic interactions, i.e. the influence of many genes can have an influence on each gene. And so this is the, the problem with looking at, we wanted to study intrinsic noise or extrinsic noise. We then need to control genotype. But if you control genotype, you're, you generate the single genotype and then your results are no longer robust because you're not looking across enough genotypes. And so there's this, this trade-off again in our study design where we really wanna have many copies of the same genotype. And that genotype really should look very much like an outbreak or wild type organism. And um, this is something that, you know, you can really see in human twin studies. And this is why human twin studies are so useful because that's exactly what you have. So for human twins, you have outbred humans. The, they are full of ordinary, they're not inbred like mice to generate genetic replicability. They're outbred. So monozygotic twins, you know, are different in some ways from dizygotic. They're 
um, there are some differences, but for the most part, they sample from the same genetic variability as dizygotic twins. And so one really is looking at genetic replicates in this case that um, or have all the outbred variability that one expects of, of ordinary twins. And so you can really measure the influence of genetic background in a holistic sense and how much variability there is even when you have a fixed genotype. And so we see certainly higher methylation, methylation similarity among monozygotic over dizygotic twins. So this is a class of epigenetic signal. But some of that signal might be variable across time. It's very hard to measure. And it's also true that it's hard to get human uh, identical twins where you really control for the environment. So twins, you know, we love using identical twins. They are the gold standard for measuring heritability. But if you think about it, they're actually not that strong a standard because of course they live very different lives. Uh, a person can get a sunburn and that, that has a long, a very large influence on their gene expression. It's very evident. So their, their environment is not really controlled. So um, another feature that makes twins a little problematic to use as a, in a general sense, aside from this lack of environmental control is that they're quite unusual on humans. So already once you have an uh, uh, identical twin in humans, you're saying that it's an unusual, it's, it possibly doesn't generalize to the ordinary course of development. And this is just the consequence of, of um, uh, you know, reproductive drugs for people having children later in life, which creates a greater probability of twinning, but certainly twinning is not the ordinary course of human development. And so what we'd really like in an organism is an organism where we have a lot of identical offspring, they're outbred, so they're not just clonally the same for every set of identical offspring. And we'd like that to be a sort of ordinary thing that happens. And actually we'd like them to be mammals as well. So you can find this in non-mammals, but, but in mammals, it's challenging. And that's enter, enter the armadillo. So this is why I'm fascinated by armadillos because they have all these features. And uh, armadillos are very, very unusual in having all these features. Um, in fact, unique in producing uh, the species we're looking at, monozygotic quadruplets. And in, in actual fact, mammals in general do not produce identical offspring. So even humans are quite unusual in producing identical offspring as frequently as we do. Uh, most mammals, dogs, cats, uh, you know, any, any other type of mammal don't really produce identical offspring, whereas um, humans produce them occasionally, armadillos produce them all the time. So every litter is like a new strain of outbred mice, which is very powerful because it gives us genetic replicates that are outbred. And so we can repeat studies over and over again and really sample across diverse, uncorrelated uh, you know, genotypic variation. In fact, the history of armadillos to me is fascinating. I, I love this quote from a 1909 paper. And so if you ask people, how old is the concept of identical twins? They often think it's quite old. And the reason for that is that certainly when, you know, you can read Greek mythology and read about twins, right? The, the child who is the offspring of, you know, Zeus or the child who is the offspring of some mortal. And, um, but e even in that story or those stories, inherent is the idea that yeah, they don't quite understand the way heritability works, that, that the father would tend to be the same father. And in fact, in general, the, the idea that there truly were identical twins discreetly from non-identical twins was not clear until quite recently. And in fact, the place it was, was made relatively clear um, was armadillos, among other places. And so I like this quote that um, uh, the bearing of this work, i.e. armadillo polyembryony, on the latter problem of sex determination is obvious. And we hope that a study of the early developmental stages will lend a solution to this problem and also furnish a satisfactory explanation of the puzzling question of identical twins, and thus raise this explanation from the plane of conjecture to the dignity of observed facts. So actually armadillos have a, a very rich and old history with identical twinning because that's where it was discovered or at least proven. And there's variability across the species in South America, and there's been a particular uh, large expansion. Um, it's a new world mammal through uh, North America, through the, the Southeast United States of um, armadillos. So in fact, in, within our lifespan, there's been this, this large scale expansion of armadillos. And they actually exhibit variation in their polyembryony as well. So different species exhibit slightly different numbers, which is an interesting feature if one wants to think about potentially en engineering it in, in model organisms. But we're gonna look at uh, uh, four, so poly polyembryony four, so quadruplet sets. Um, uh, even though much larger numbers exist, they're much rarer. So just to return to, to why this is useful. So traditionally, again, Waddington proposed the Waddington landscape to talk about how is it that you can have a cell, um, you start it with a single cell, 
and you end up with many, many different types of cells and they all have the same genotype. How does that happen? And the idea was there's progressive addition of epigenetic factors that moves the shared genotype down through different uh, uh, patterns to end up in different cell types, different developmental lineages, different specifications, and that builds an organism across all. And we're saying, well, the same idea applies to armadillos. Now, instead of each one of these points here being, a, let's say, a cell at that stage, each one could be a, an armadillo quadruplet. They have the same genotype, fixed genotype. The environment is largely fixed because we, they're in a colony that's controlled. And so the question is, how much variability is there in their final organismal phenotype, given that the genetics are controlled? And the way we're going to study this is we're going to measure armadillo gene expression over time in sets of quadruplets. So we're going to sample sets of armadillos, uh, litters of armadillos, sets of four, five of them, over a period of time points over a couple of years, which is a, a reasonable fraction of their life from early development onward. We're just going to measure RNA in the blood. So that's, it's a relatively, um, uh, you know, it's not a whole body measurement, but we hope it, it samples some reasonable phenotypic variability particularly from cell lineages that are shared back to early, early development. And we're gonna ask, are there features that we can see that let us measure intrinsic versus extrinsic noise, which we're gonna need a mathematical formalism to, to determine. And then what sort of variability do we see in the armadillos that could be explained by these features in noise? And then finally, I'll, I'll touch briefly on why this matters at all. So first I, I wanna show this for any gene expression aficionados. Uh, so this is a, to me a beautiful, beautiful heat map. I was very happy when I saw it. So each uh, you know, uh, column and row here is an armadillo. The height, the color of the heat map is the correlation of the transcriptional profile. And the point I wanna make is that the dynamic range goes from about 0.96 to one. So the transcriptional profiles are extremely, extremely correlated. And uh, even 0.96, is much higher than you would see often in replicates where you don't have full environmental control. So all these armadillos are living extremely similar lives because we control their environment to a strong degree. That said, you can see the influence of genetics very, very clearly. Each of these four sets where the correlation is going up to let's say 0.99 or so, 0 0.98, 0 0.99, are a quadruplet set. So that's saying that the identical quadruplets have transcriptional outputs that in aggregate are much more similar than even the broad similarity that armadillos are exhibiting because we're controlling the environment. And then I wanna highlight that what we're actually looking for in the study is, is very, very hard. We're not looking at this sort of difference. What we're looking at is the differences within this space. We're interested in variability that conditioned on genotype. So given the genotype still exists. So that, that is very, very subtle variability because the transcriptional profiles are extremely similar with given a genotype and controlling the environment. Nonetheless, we, we think it's um, uh, possible to measure it, as I'll show you. And you can see the difference in the, if I just look at the marginal distributions from that um, heat map, you can see the within quadruplet sets, you know, the median value of about 0.99 and the cross quadruplets, you know, somewhere between 0.97 and 0.98. So very highly correlated, and that's because of the environmental control. So you can definitely get variability if you look at different time points and um, uh, where there are different developmental stages and therefore you'll have some degree of variability, but for the most part, it's uh, a very tightly controlled. And um, important to us is that variability uh, generalizes to humans. So we looked at the set of genes that were not variable, and those sets of genes, when you look at them within armadillos and you build a predictor from the armadillo data, predict the human housekeeping gene. So the set of genes that are not variable in armadillos also predict the human housekeeping genes. And you'll see AURCs a lot. It's a machine learning statistic, which I, is my favorite one, which is basically the probability of, of assigning the status of housekeeping gene correct if you had a housekeeping gene and a non-housekeeping gene in humans based on the armadillo data. So the armadillo data is predicting the human data quite well with respect to variability, which is the key feature we're going to be looking at. So I wanted to step back and, and look at the Waddington landscape from a... a I talked about cell lineages when I was describing it just to show them. You have the state of a cell dividing and dividing and dividing, and you end up with these, these are cell lineages moving down this path. And uh, the important kind of feature that can happen along these lineages is expression can be set. And expression can be set at the, at, in a global sense, meaning the expression level of a gene can be set, but also the allelic expression can be set, meaning which copy of your two chromosomes is expressed relative to the other at a certain level. 
And again, the clearest example of that is the calico cat of cats, where that's exactly what happens on the X chromosome. So this is a lot like saying X inactivation happens at this time point. Blue is uh, uh, one of the Xs being set to be active in one cell. Yellow is another cell being active in the other cell. And then that's inherited down those lineages. So every cell that comes after that will inherit that X being active. And that's what ends up causing the coloration pattern of the cat's coat. And that's also why it isn't just a blur is because the cells clonally expand in their epigenetic status, they expand and that creates a pool of that color being present. And our real question is, can we measure this on the autosomes? So that's happening on the sex chromosomes, on the X chromosome. Is it possible that this is also happening on the autosomes? And that would be intrinsic noise. So something is coming in from outside the cell. It, it is, the cell sees the same signal, but the two chromosomes end up generating different signals and that's intrinsic noise. In contrast, if this is an expression level change, that's something that the cell as a whole is seeing. And so that's extrinsic noise. And this can be modeled. It's, it's, this is very easy to model because if it's, you know, it's two alleles, we have two copies of the chromosomes, we have two copies of the genes. Uh, it's, a, and it, it's a coin flip about which is expressed or which is not expressed in the case of X and activation. And that's just a bino binomial distribution. And that, uh, you know, we don't know when it happens. So the actual N is, is unknown, but looking at the variance of the final distribution can tell you that. So again, uh, an important um, case of this happening is just in all women, um, in humans, I mean, it's an important case, and in fact, all mammals, which is that X inactivation, absolutely, there is this class of variability where at the, let's say 10 cell stage, each cell flips a coin picks an X to be active, and that's, that's inherited down each of the cells thereafter. And that means every cell in women thereafter is expressing one of the two Xs, whereas in men, just there's just a single X to be expressed. And this balances the gene expression, but it does mean that women have, are, are a mosaic, meaning a mix of the two types of Xs being expressed. And that's why calico cats end up having the two Xs expressed and calico cats are female. Uh, so there's this tissue mosaicism. So and you can really see this being present. So this is measuring in human tissues, the um, skew ratio, mean, meaning the ratio of the excess being expressed. And in this case, when the coin was flipped early in development, it ended up being five heads and five tails. And so there's an equal mix of both X's. And in this one, you can see it ends up, it was more like 80-20. So it, it was eight heads and two tails. And it was pretty consistent across tissues, which is because it happens mainly before tissue specification. So these, this is a nice example to me of early lineage choices having a long-term early stochasticity, intrinsic stochasticity, having a big impact because a coin is flipped at the 10 cell stage and for the rest of, give or take, for the rest of that woman's life, they'll have a split epigenetically of, of that split as defined at that, that early stage. And um, that will affect which genes were expressed at which level, which alleles were expressed at which level. And if some of them are disease causing, that could actually cause disease as well. So this is an important feature and it has nothing to do with genetics. It's purely epigenetic. It's very obvious on the sex chromosomes uh, and you can see it in our armadillos beautifully that um, you know, one armadillo, this is a quadruplet set. This is the X ratio. You can't tell these two apart, but this one for the rest of its life has a ratio of 0.63 plus or minus a bit. So it ended up flipping the coin on its X inactivation and ended up having a slightly skew ratio. And we can use the variance in that distribution. So if you think about it, if there were a million cells and each one flipped a coin, you would end up with a number very close to 0.5 for the rest of time. And if there were two cells and you flipped a coin, you would end up with ratios of either 100% in one direction, 100% in the other direction, or 50-50. And so because that's inherited down the cell lineage forever, the final ratio that you see, the final distribution that you see across all of these uh, ratios and all armadillos tells us how many cells were present when X inactivation was set. And we get 25 cells by looking at the X inactivation ratios, which is probably correct based on other mammals. And plus or minus, I'll say about a cell division. So the fact we don't log scale this makes this look wider than it is, but it's pretty good. It's within about a cell division of 25 cells. So we wanna, we wanna do that exact same assessment. So historically, it has not really been known if this occurs on autosomes. It's actually been a very debated literature uh, whether this occurs other than occurring on the X where it, it very obviously occurs. And so what we're gonna do is use exactly the same signal we saw on the X 
which is variation in identity that was permanent. So one armadillo had one signal and it was permanent for the rest of time. And we're gonna use that variability in signal and measure it for the rest of time and see if that occurs on autosomes as well. And this is just going about how we do that. So that what we wanna do is not pick individual alleles, although we can do that too based on their variability, but actually add up the aggregate impact of all alleles. And so we, we the same way we had for X's, we would have said, the one that was 0.63, if we see an armadillo with 0.63 later, we think it's that armadillo. We basically formulate this as a prediction task where the ratios on the autosomes are used to predict the identities of armadillos of the future. So this is asking if intrinsic noise, allelic variability or extrinsic noise expression levels can be used to predict the identity of the armadillo later. And if it can, we say, ah, then that signal must be something that was set early in development and was fixed thereafter because it was permanent from early development on. And so XQ in particular, we can, we can you know, operate this formalism and we get that it works quite well, which is that this is the predictability score, which is basically out of four, how many we get right. And this is the null distribution. And so we're very significantly predicting identity using the X. And then the question is, um, does that happen on the autosomes as well? So off of the X and the answer is yes, very substantially. So we can see that um, using just the aggregate autosomal impact, there are many, many genes where there's allelic variability, intrinsic noise, that is permanent, specifies the armadillo's identity uh, forever, and um, uh, you know is about um, significant to the tune of about a half an X chromosome. So it's not quite as significant as an entire X chromosome, but the X chromosome variability has a large impact on phenotype and disease penetrance. And this is um, uh, probably subject to less purifying selection in the X chromosome. And so this, this is potentially something that would matter for disease, which I'll show you a model for at the end, which is if you have a disease allele, which would cause disease, and you end up with it being the one that was randomly picked to be expressed, you'll end up with the disease. And if not, you won't get the disease, but that's not genetic. Um, and the genes don't overlap uh, significantly across the armadillos. They're not particularly present in the female armadillo, so it's not like these are missing imitated X-linked genes. And we can do the same thing with extrinsic noise, which is look at the gene expression levels across the armadillos rather than the ratio of alleles and do the almost the exact same analysis, which is looking at whether armadillos are showing correlated expression profiles over time with themselves. So if I have a high gene expression relative to my siblings, is that the same uh, uh, over time? And if so, I think that's a permanent feature of my development. And again, we get um, significance, but less so. And this makes sense because this is probably under more selection for stability because it has more of a functional impact. So there is some fixed level changes in gene expression where you know your immune system might be differently uh, fixed at some set point depending on early development but that happens much less than having one allele of the gene one of the two copies being higher expressed the allelic effect is so strong that we can actually use it to trace the lineages which is pretty extraordinary whereas the expression effect is just nudging on the end of, of significance meaning this is important probably um, in setting, determining set points for your say immune system or weight or other sources of variability we see in the armadillos, but it's not quite as strongly, um, quite, quite a strong impact. Okay, to return to why this matters at all, why do we have to do this in armadillos as opposed to, to humans? Um, when we look at human data, uh, which is let's say this bottom one, there's an awful lot of day-to-day -day variability that we don't think affects the set points of the genes. People have a cold, which is not a huge functional impact on them um, in terms of you know, their long-term health and fitness. It has an extraordinary effect on their expression levels, right? So these sort of short-term, you know, but important responses that we have to environmental stimuli generate a ton of up and down sort of noise as shown in this bottom graph. Whereas in the armadillos, we have, we're able to control all the environmental effects and a lot of even the early developmental ones. And so it's much easier to measure variability, uh, particularly extrinsic variability actually, um, uh, which is extrinsic variability in particular, which is, is not just short-term um, stuff that doesn't matter, but canalized extrinsic variability. And um, this isn't actually, this is empirical data. So we have human twins data, which we've looked at, and you can just see that if you take every gene and look at its uh, um, full change relative to the identical you know, pairs, either twins or, or quadruplets, the full changes in general are much higher for, for identical twins across both monozygotic and dizygotic. And that reflects the fact that a lot of that variability is, um, is environmental variability. So it doesn't vary much from, from monozygotic to dizygotic. It does a bit, 
There's some genetic variability, but there's just a, a lot of, of environmental variability which isn't controlled in the twins. And so that's why armadillos are a very useful system, probably generalized to humans. Let us figure out, you know, cell lineage estimates. Let us guess the amount of X-linked inactivation. Let us determine um, X-linked lineages and other lineages, um, and probably let us figure out functional features which are uh, linked to phenotype. And the reason why all of that matters to, to human um, health and welfare is that that argument I presented earlier. And so this is an, an idea about, you know, uh, recently there's been more and more of an idea that um, rare variation can have an impact on phenotype. I would say within the last 10 or 15 years, that, that's been a more and more important idea. And one of the ways that can happen, of course, is if you get two, you know, um, rare copies of a gene, that's going to have a huge impact on you because you don't have one good copy. But normally we're pretty well protected if we have only one good copy. So if we only have one good copy of a gene, we're mostly haplosufficient, meaning haplosufficient, meaning one copy is enough. Okay, but what could what could stop that from happening? Well, one way you can stop it from happening by accident is having two bad copies. But the other is if that bad copy or, or good copy is associated with a gene that has one of these allelic signatures, and the bad allele is the one that gets chosen to be expressed, then you're in trouble because then you'll end up with the disease. And this will generate variability in phenotype, large variability in phenotype, which we won't understand from genetics. And so to some degree, this is hidden um, variability. And this model on the right here is saying, if this is our model of disease penetrance, that we need a certain allelic ratio to, to have the disease in the bad direction. And the allelic ratio is dependent on the early cell population number. Then we can model the likelihood of um, the disease being due to having two bad variants, or it be being due to having been unlucky in that early coin flip. And so this is the disease allele frequency. When the disease is very rare, it will always be because of the coin flip, because the odds of getting two bad alleles are just so low. Likewise, if the number of cells is very small, then it becomes very probable, relatively, that you'll have a bad coin flip by chance that's inherited down the cell lineage. And so there's a very large zone of probability here where um, you are much more likely to get a disease, not by inheriting two bad copies, but by inheriting one bad copy and it being linked to some lineage specification step and you getting up being unlucky. So we continue with the armadillo work and our, our hope is really that it is a translational model for understanding the lineage effects of, of rare variability. And with that, um, I just wanna thank everyone in my lab who worked on this, which is a, a long list, but particularly Sarah Deleuze at the top and more recently Lisa. Um, and also our collaborators at the HRSA, who uh, actually house and care for the armadillos. And thank you all. Happy to take any questions. All right. That was wonderful. Well, I'm waiting for questions to come in from the, uh, the online audience. Do we have any locally? Yeah, so hold on. Laurie's got one. Uh, thank you. Um, it, it was everything I hoped. So um, um, I have the narrowest question I've ever asked, and someday I'll tell you why. It's really important to me. Do, uh, how many? Uh, there are three. They're all linked. How many genes does an armadillo have? I don't. I don't remember if you said. Is it sort of human-like? It's hu It's human-like. Yeah, I didn't say. It's about twenty k, depending okay. on. Uh, you know how far you extend it, but it's human-like. So, so to a first approximation, any gene that's involved in a disease in humans has a decent chance of being found in an armadillo. Um, uh, to a first approximation, yes, I wouldn't say um, every. So, so uh, you know, it's it's the furthest out group. It's the furthest in group within mammals, right? So, but it's it's almost uh, the, the the furthest you can get and still be a mammal. So it's much further, for example, than you know mice even. Now, within mammals, most things have still. I mean, we're not plants, so they still mostly have one to one orthologs. So you're mostly pretty good, but I I wouldn't you know I wouldn't guarantee it. Okay. So so my question, which is a request is that you look up the genes in an armadillo and send me a little note that says armadillos do or do not have a math b m a f b gene so this is really 
a, a chance. I'm really asking you a rare disease question because Don't you have a chance of affecting, you have a yeah. chance of ma making rare yeah. disease, I don't know what the right word is, ex examples that represent one out of four uh, of the progeny of any mommy, right? I mean, because even though you're, most of it is about, a lot of it is about X inactivation, there's all this other stuff going on, yes? Right, so if one, if, if depending on the disease that you're thinking of, but if it's a disease like a lot of diseases, like let's say autism, where, where rare variation has been very heavily studied, and let's say you have, you know, in the armadillos, you have one, um, a, you know, bad copy and one good copy of one of the, the genes that can cause autism, you know, extreme cases of autism, not, not mild cases, then you will see a lot of variability in the offspring because many of them will get, have a sufficient level of both that they're just protected, but you'll see some would then have it. Yeah, so ab absolutely, it's, it's ideally, it's a model for how rare, particularly rare um, variability can be phenotypically penetrant, you know, but only sometimes. Okay, well, th thank you for that. Well, we only have a, a couple more minutes, so I'm, I'm curious, maybe I can get you to speculate a little bit, Jesse, about uh, incomplete penetrance generally. So one of, the, one of the sort of shocks, I think, of the genomic era is how poor a job genetics has done at explaining disease incidents broadly. So how much do you think is related to the mechanisms that you just described? I guess I'm, I'm willing to take even, I would be hopeful for some would be an answer, <laughs> meaning, um, you know, it's a, big, it's a big pie. And I think um, increasing resolution and coverage on common variation explains, does explain some of that missing, you know, pieces. Um, rare variability famously, right, is explained a, a lot. And I would say that, that um, variability of this class explains at least some. Now, it's not missing heritability, you know, in, in the long, long term, meaning you'll see it eventually, but I think it probably has some impact. Um, but what percentage, I don't know. I guess I'm actually rather optimistic, even though I've, I bet, in a way, I bet on the horse of, of stochasticity and development being important for phenotypic variability. I'm kind of optimistic that as, you know, we get better and better quality genomic data, uh, that even common variability will eat up an increasingly large of its already large pie and, and, and do better and better. Because, you know, th that is another thing that's been ongoing, right? We, the human genome has been completed so many times and continues to be, you know, e expanded and completed with, you know, pan genomes and things like that, where you're, you're sampling better from the population variability. All right, and we do have a question from the virtual audience, finally. So, uh, and it's a, it's a very basic one that I, I hope you can answer. Um, and the question is basically, why do armadillos produce monozygotic offspring? What was the evolutionary selective pressure? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So it's, it's a good question. So I, I'd invite the audience to think about it for a moment. Um, it doesn't make, doesn't make sense that they do, right? I've said already that mammals don't in general. So mammals don't, and that makes sense that they don't. Why, why would you produce identical offspring? The whole point of sexual reproduction, one might think at least is to produce variable offspring. So of course, uh, it, it, it seems puzzling that armadillos do it. Now, one of, one of the things I mentioned when I was quoting that 1909 paper um, is that, yeah, identical offspring share a sex. That's the most obvious phenotypic feature that's you know, genetically determined. And so if you make things genotyp you know, you the same genotype, you're at least preventing potentially inbreeding within, among siblings. But what's likelier than, that, than there being any functional explanation at all is that it's just one of these wacky stories in biology and, uh, um, you know, mechanisms of, of like everything associated with reproduction often ends up quite wackily variable in biology. This is just one of those things that happen when, you know, you, you want to expand the litter size. So maybe you're shifting your reproductive strategy. And yeah, the first thing that happened to expand it was, uh, you know, polyembryony. It will be selected for, but if they could have, they might very well have had variable offspring in the litters if that could have been done as easily right away. But there is no like strongly known explanation for why they do it. And it, it is in fact a mystery. All right. Oh, wait, we, we do have one more uh, quickly in the last minute. Yeah, in relation to that, is there some genetic variation? You, you kind of alluded that there is genetic variation about the number of 
identical twins, you know, that a different armadillo species yep. have. So I'm just wondering if that's known, the molecular mechanisms that kind of helps to split, you know, like four division into four rather than three rather than... Nope. So it definitely it's genetic, meaning yeah. it's clearly linked to which species is which. Um, to the extent that there's variability within that, it's probably just about whether the, the embryos all survive. So, you know, an eight might sometimes be a seven or a six, like quite regularly because they don't even all survive to, to birth. But, uh, yeah, you know, figuring out the exact genetics is a challenge. This is, you know, when, when you start working with non-model organisms, you do uh, enter a different world. So, you know, I, I talked a lot about the X chromosome, but did the, the reference genome for the armadillo have an X chromosome before we started? And the answer is no. So, so uh, it's challenging to, to work with these non-model organisms, but discovering that variability if we sample across the different genotypes and other uh, mammals, yeah, that, I think that'd be a really interesting thing to work on. And what portion of the genome is, uh, you know, have this kind of allele exclusion? Uh, because that's, of course, also an important question. Uh, yeah, it, it depends on the strength of the signature you're thinking of, but. I would say broadly, like, um, you know, 5% would, would be a reasonable number. Now, 5% is not a huge number. Um, it's probably larger if you are thinking of stuff that happens later and later in development um, so that the effect is much smaller. But it makes sense because, again, it's something that can cause disease. So it's been selectively, you know, it, we don't mostly produce it, produce it. And even 5%, I think, because of the potential trans effects, you know, you have one gene doing something quite different than another and then uh, further away, that affects other genes and other genes and other genes. It, it could be quite large. But then the logical thing would be that this particular heterogeneity in phenotypes that would be due to that mechanism would be much more likely in this 5% genes that have this. And it, is it something that we see? Or, but I guess you can't test that in Armadillo. So. No, but, but I don't think that's true. I, so I, think, I don't think that the, the, the set of genes that show this variability, I don't think have been selected for in order to generate that variability across the armadillos. I, I, I'm using the armadillos as an asset into the fact that that variability exists in all mammals all the time. I, so, so early cell variability, there's every organism went through a stage when it had four cells and something binding could have an effect if it's a permanent, if you're moving down that Waddington landscape and you're pushed onto one path when you're four cells, which can happen really easily, that's going to have a permanent effect. But the armadillos are just a way of seeing that, right? But they, I don't think they selected for generating that variability, uh, per se. Yeah, I was more trying to say that the, the, even in, I, I don't know how many of the genes that have this kind of monoallelic, of a monochromosome inactivations, this 5% vary between armadillo and humans, but let's say that they don't vary that much, which is, I think, reasonable. Then you can go to humans and ask the question, do you see more uh, uh, variation in, f in phenotype expressivity in these 5% genes? That oh, I see. Yeah, excellent point. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so right. I think one would, um, one, would, one would wonder about that exactly. The problem is, and this is why the armadillos were so essential, is that genetics is, you saw those red blocks that were very bright on top of the, the background. I pretended when I talked about it that it's a coin flip, but the coin flip is actually not 50-50 for anything ever, except the X chromosome, maybe. So most of the time you have genetic variability that drives m most of the variance to like 70-30 or 60-40 or whatever it is. And on top of that, we have the, the stochasticity. And so probably, and this this is sort of was my, my answer to the earlier question about what, what do I think is contributing more to human phenotypic variability, but the genetic variability probably swamps the effect of the, the, the stochasticity unless you control for it. It's very hard to look at it in a controlled way in humans because there's so much genetic variability that you just can't control for across the entire genome. So I think in theory, you're right if we could control for the, for the, the entire genetic background in humans, um, but we mostly can't. So we end up being affected by whether you know, there was selection for or against there being variants in the genome um, for those genes. All right, Jesse, thank you very much. That was wonderful, very interesting.